were teaming up to test school readiness as a cross-disciplinary boundary object, actualizing early exclusion in the Swedish Comprehensive School 1945 to 1975. Our speakers are Kristin Mundal and Anna Algren uh, from Sweden. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, do we also have 37 minutes or only 23? <laughs> Uh, teaming up to the test, uh, you're both from uh, the field of history and education and we have been working on assessment and testing of, of education and today we will present a case uh, from Sweden on the school readiness test which uh, also uh, were used in, in other countries. Uh, but Sweden was one of the first countries that really worked towards a comprehensive schooling system um, and that is sort of uh, uh, in contradiction to a track school system that was very common uh, in, in, in Europe and still is. Um, and the efforts uh, 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 constructing this uh, a comprehensive school took part mainly between 1940 and 1975. And the main idea was to introduce uh, a late differentiation, but we will argue that actually there were methods uh, uh, contain, continuing with, with quite an early differentiation, especially through the, the school readiness uh, uh, tests. We have been looking at uh, different kinds of, of uh, uh, government reports, uh, scientific statement and work, and political debates, and we have also been looking more in detail at the actual school readiness tests and, and protocols. Theoretically, we have been using the, the, the now quite famous concepts of boundary objects by Starr and Reismer, uh, where they describe the boundary object as an object which are both plastic enough to adapt to local needs and the constraints of several parties employing them, yet robust enough to maintain a common identity across sites. So a boundary concept, a boundary object can be suspected to be quite ambiguous and being ambiguous, it helps different uh, trajectories, theoretical and practical, uh, or professionals to, to work, work together, which would not have been possible if the concept or the object would have been very well defined within a specific scientific uh, discipline. Uh, and this was sort of the case when our case started, the, 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 the very complex tracked school system with a late differentiation, where with an early differentiation, where you after four grades in the educational system choose if you would follow a more theoretical path or a practical oriented path or a longer school path or a shorter school path. And then we also have, have girls' school. So the idea with the comprehensive school was to simplify this both for administrative purposes but also for uh, justice and equality purposes. And uh, these are the main different school forms that were existing from the uh, 19th century, and uh, there are the Swedish words for them. But the two on the side, Slaudenberg and the girls' school, Fikskola, they were from children from upper class. Uh, the folk school in the middle was the most common public school, mostly for working class. The entry age in these different school forms were varied. In folk school, kids started between the age of seven and nine. Most common was seven years old. Uh, there were also possibility to start at age six in some of these schools. In the girls' school, uh, girls were enrolled between the age of 8 and 12, and in this ladder bike you could start from age 9. Most of these children have had some form of private tutoring before, uh, often in the homes, by, by some kind of private tutor. Um, all of these were to be formed together so that all children would start in the same school. Um, there were a lot of preparation for this comprehensive school. There were political investigations, there were uh, committees put together to discuss how to make this happen, how to put these different school forms together. There were trial schools for almost a decade. Uh, there were preparations and then finally there was an established 
uh, bill for the comprehensive school. We're going to look into how these uh, different forums handle this a little bit. Uh, first, the political arguments now, what, what they wanted with the school, uh, the comprehensive school, the school for all, is kind of twofold. It is first that they want to, this is from the school investigation in the 1940s, uh, they want an all-encompassing, organically integrated educational school system. And the importance here is that each individual, independent of place of birth, uh, social and economic status should receive the same kind of education where the individual talent, powers and attitude were taken into consideration. There was also, as presented in the school commission from 1946, a democratic national purpose where all layers of society should contribute to creating a uniform national formation. So it was important to form a national unity here. So these were kind of the two um, going into. However, there were challenges. There were a lot of challenges in preparing this. Uh, we're going to look at one of them. As I mentioned before, there were different uh, entry ages in the different school forms that were existing prior to this. Now we had to put all kids in, um, in the same school. There were no sorting, not, no differentiation supposed to happen at the beginning of this school. That was the main important um, thing here, that there was going to be a late differentiation, because everybody should have the same um, possibilities. So to find a neutral ground to sort the, the groups, of groups of learners, age became uh, the only sorting aspect. Uh, we were also in need to form uh, to have this individually shaped teaching in these large heterogeneous groups. And this school investigation, already in 1940 or in 1944 when it was published, saw that this undifferentiated grade composition based on age will present different conditions than what we have seen before. We will we will see challenges. When we have when we're to put kids in at the same age, um, yeah, this school investigation uh, from 1940 was a group of experts. We call them. They were academics. They were from different fields: economics, pediatrics, linguistics. They were also uh, teachers, teacher representatives, school inspectors, principals. They came together to look at these different questions. Um, they were looking into at what age. Children should start school. This was a little bit different in, in uh, uh, Europe and the US at the time. But here they had seen that um, seven, which has been the, the most common age group, uh, worked. But they also said that when children who have started uh, school before the age of seven, they have often reached very good results. So there should be opportunities for kids who are mature to start early. However, they have to be. Uh, physically and mentally school ready. So here we have the concept of school ready uh, coming up. And what they say is that a preschool would ensure a safer selection. So the, this is how it kind of came into uh, to the, the debate. Um, but then the school investigation also reached out to another group of experts, even more experts, to look into this. When is the uh, best age to start school. Yeah, exactly. What, what do politicians do when they don't know what to do? They turn to science, and then they don't care about what the scientists say. But anyhow, in, 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 in the 1940s, they turned to the four professors in psychology and education. Uh, it was a joint discipline by then in, in Sweden. Today, then they, there were only four professors. Today, we are 180 professors just within the field of education, and approximately the same amount within within psychology. And they were looking at when would be the most proper uh, age to, to start school. And they came up with sort of similar s suggestions around age seven. But what we can see is that they argue a bit differently and they use uh, different theoretical support for their arguments. Uh, many turn to various kinds of psychological theories. Two of them uh, turned to, to 
Thurman and Thorndike studies in, in, in the United States saying that, well, the average age when students started in Sweden was at this time 7.2 years old and about 60% of uh, the students of that age would have the proper intelligence uh, being the intelligence between 6.5 year and, and 8.9, but 20% could be considered having below the, the intelligence age of 6.5, but according to this first professor, professor they should not be stopped from, from starting school for, for social reasons. Um, the second one argue in a similar fashion, but also add some anthropometrical research, uh, weighing the, the brain um, and, 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 um, and, and, and discussing sort of also the, the, the physical development of the child in relation to the intellectual development of, 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 of the child. So here we have a more medical perspective coming in and also uh, I think three of them refer to Piaget and the, 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 the developmental curves. Uh, so we can see actually the curves really creates also a kind of reasoning. So the, the curves get imprinted in their intellectual fabrication of, of, of school age in, in a quite obvious, obvious way. David Katz, uh, he was a, a Jewish refugee from Germany. He said without any evidence that the pupils in Sweden probably mature a bit later than the pupils in, in Germany. So even if they start at the age of six in Germany, seven would be more appropriate age in, in, in Sweden. And he also goes that far and say that, but even in the countryside of Sweden, they might develop even later. And, and, and he explains this by language de development. So, uh, so he, he also comes to the conclusion, a bit arbitrary, that the age of seven would be a proper age to, to start schooling in, in Sweden. And the third one, Jon Lundqvist, many people in Sweden wonder how he came to be a professor in education and psychology. Actually, he came from the field of literature. He has quite few references. And he, 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 when he referred to a mental age uh, in opposition to chronological age, he, 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 he has different figures than the ones referring to Thurman and, 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 and Fornberg. So we can see that the four main experts in Sweden that should be experts on this, well, they used very different kinds of reasoning, very different uh, uh, sources and re sources of references. Uh, and, and they seem very sure about what they say, but actually they mainly say, let's say, let everything be as it has always been, a normal school age start around, around seven. And this is quite interesting, speaking of boundary objects. Uh, the the uh, educational investigation also invited a layman advisory board to read the professor uh, expertise uh, standpoints and, and have comments on it. Here we have a theology candidate, we have a prison director, we have a lot of uh, misses, um, I would guess mothers, uh, and, and we, have, um, we have a store manager and a farmer, etc. That, that, that read the, the investigation and they had, they had comments and none of them really referred to uh, the need of, of uh, uh, school readiness test. They, they say that we already have the possibility to put children that seems a bit more intellectually developed in school when they are in age six, or we can, can refrain them from going to school up until eight or nine. So the possibility already existed. They, they said that maybe if we really need uh, an objective uh, statement of the school readiness, then we can use, use tests. Uh, another was the school commission from 1946, who took this investigation and these four professors 
uh, statements and work this forward towards uh, a suggestion. This was uh, um, a group of politicians, mainly social democratics. Uh, they were, there were also some representatives from other political parties. Uh, they had one non-political member to represent uh, parental interests, and then they had 10 expert delegations, but they were also um, dominated by social democrats. So here the shift turned into very much political. Um, what they said now was that, uh, okay, we have heard that the age of seven is the most suitable, so we agree on this. Uh, however, children may enter at the year they turn six, this should be according to a medical examination and through testing. Uh, it is also important to see that for some kids, they are not ready, uh, as Christian said, when they are seven. They should be able to start later because to enter school too early can also cause serious harm to these children. So now they came into a decade of trial schools. They had uh, different trial school districts. Approximately uh, one third of Swedish children started school in these trial classes. Um, the school readiness tests came into practice, not as something as was suggested by these investigations, something to use in special situations. But in most, in many municipalities in Sweden, all kids um, took these tests. Uh, and they, they had some school readiness classes and help classes for some of the kids who didn't pass these tests. But most of them were held back one year. Uh, some of them recommended a year of preschool. Uh, not all children went to preschool at this time. Um, however, there were never established how to do these, um, how to perform these tests and what tests to use. That was uh, in the name of science, uh, suggested to be open, to continue to develop and investigate these tests. Uh, they were never mandatory. In the 1957 school preparation, uh, they were still uh, voluntarily to use, and they should not be locked into a specific uh, rule form of testing. They should be, continue to be the subject of scientific research. Um, so the school readiness was a concept that was needed for this late differentiation that was desired with the unit school, uh, an age-based teaching that still required some sort of sorting because there were a lot of kids who didn't fit in this age-based teaching and we needed neutral reasons for this diversity problems because we couldn't, as before, blame it on other circumstances. Uh, so this concept of school readiness was built upon, uh, as mentioned before, a series of children's con cognitive development in stages uh, of social ma maturity as ability to cope outside of home and family, but also as physical traits of psychological and social maturity, uh, in, uh, influenced by uh, the German uh, pediatric uh, Wilfried Seller, it was thought that there were different body types in children in which you could see if they were school ready or not, and that there was this toddler type or small small child type that was, you know, when they have a little bit bigger head and shorter arms. And he said that with this body type, there were hollow areas in the body. These hollow areas made it difficult for the child to be away from his mother. So when they reached this um, school ready, body type with a little bit longer arms and more proportional, they were ready to be outside of the home. Uh, the school readiness tests were in, uh, in this uh, uh, 1946 school commission uh, said to be able to try for school readiness. With this, we could place the child in the correct year class, we could have guidance on individualization, and there would be possibility to start early. Uh, so the actual tests tested cognitive abilities, patterns and sorting exercises, social maturity. They were uh, looked at how, to, how they behaved in group and these physical aspects. There were, as I said, no standardized tests. So there were different tests. Uh, these are just a short description of two of these different tests to show how different they could be. They were usually called after the town they were developed in. So Kalmar is a Swedish town. Uh, this is um, 
developed by Fritz V. Foch, who was actually a mathematician to begin with. Uh, for this test, it was a very long test. It was a medical examination, uh, 12 lesson play school where they were absorbed, individual tests, and then they, were, they had points that were calculated together. Another test, Uppsala, another Swedish town, developed by a teacher, was just done in 45 minutes, but there were one uh, test instructor and one observer who would observe the kid during this time. Um, our conclusions. Um, I'm running out. So we here see uh, school readiness as a boundary object. Uh, we can move to this one. The discussion moves from a political national motive to the best for the individual. Age become the natural factor. School readiness is a com concept that makes the notion of a comprehensive school possible. And this legitimizes the pol uh, political project of a school for all. So what we wonder here is if these ready, school readiness texts are actually ever needed at all. Because as Christian said, and as was mentioned in this investigations, there are already flexibility in the system. Uh, however, the school readiness became a concern for all. And the cross-disciplinary meeting here, we had a common ground, and the vagueness made it possible for these groups to come together. Uh, so what we claim is that it was actually needed to implement this comprehensive school. It took the problem away from, are we all, could, can we put all children in the same school? To, when is the child's school ready? So that is how we frame it as a boundary object and how we claim that it had an important role in the implementation of the comprehensive school. So thank you for listening. So we have uh, nine minutes for questions. Um, okay. Thank you for this very interesting uh, talk. Uh, I, I agree with you that the concept of school readiness is, is, uh, is a very interesting boundary object. Um, what I found also interesting are the differences. So, for example, also um, uh, in the German, among the Germans, the, the idea of whether the kid is ready or not has been like, I would say, an obsession. Mm. Uh, they, they still uh, recently do this kind of little test, which is, of course, a very small thing, like checking whether the child can tie his shoe in order to be accepted, and these kind of things. And if I compare this, for example, to Spain, where this never ever was a, a topic, because um, uh, especially in areas, for example, industrial areas like, such as Catalonia, where women were working, the idea was that after four months, they, 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 they had to leave their children because they had to work, right? So school readiness was not even something that was ever considered important. Uh, so I find it very interesting, and I think that it, it, uh, it could be even uh, a broader discussion to see uh, these differences with regard to also because the type of school was discussed in Spain, comprehensive, and of course it's about an older year, right? And so it's not new here. So how how this boundary object you're looking at, right, is traveling here and is uh, seen differently, sometimes totally invisible, not there, and in other places it becomes important. So I, I, I feel like you're you're at a point where there's a lot more in this in this uh, travel to to find out because I think it's very intriguing. Thank you so much enough for this good comment, uh, and and we also noted that. Well, it looks differently in other countries, and we have been talking about doing a bit of a more comparative uh, study on this. But what we can see in the Swedish case is that it looks different, I think, between different uh, socioeconomical contexts. For example, uh, the, the middle class might have been one, more concerned that, that the, the sh their graduate children will not be challenged enough if they start too late, whereas the, 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 the working class, they were afraid that their children would stay too long in education and not come out in, in work life and, and, and contribute to the family's but, economy. But this leads me to a follow-up question, yeah. because how did they deal then with the kids if they had to work? Because in Spain, I mean, they were happy that they had a place to, to leave the children. <laughs> because if the woman has to work, how are you doing that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. 
I mean, this was in a, in a time where they were also working on the establishment of the preschool simultaneously, and that was, that was more of a concern for the working mothers. They had these you know, play, play schools they would be translated into uh, for the kids who were not in school uh, at this age. So they had somewhere to be, even if they were not in school, for the ones who had working mothers. Did you have a Dalkin system already in the 50s? The uh, what? Dalkin. The Dalkin. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yes, sort of. Uh, it, it came into... Um, it was not... Um, it was it was not standardized or, or uh, driven by like at this at this point, but they started to come up, and it was also in these investigations. We didn't focus so much on that, but it was also mentioned that that would be more suitable than the school readiness test to have a preschool for all instead to prepare for school. And then what happened after this is they had they actually had these school readiness tests in practice up until as late as already. I mean, in the seventies. There were uh, groups uh, or areas where all kids were still tested, and in the 80s, uh, some some kids where they were unsure. Um, but then they took them away completely, saying that it was actually dangerous to test the kids uh, at school entry, and they would, they would instead have a whole, like almost months of very detailed um, teaching in the beginning of the school to make every, to, to replace this. But then there were, were talks of lowering the age to six with a preschool class that should be like a bridge between preschool and school and then that was uh, that was first voluntarily and that became mandatory and now that now we have that so now children start obligatory at age six but in this preschool class but now they want to make that grade one so they actually want to slowly lower the age even though we have kind of built up for years the, and what we also see here is a several hundred year of argumentation between the, 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 the gardener principle and the forest keeper principle, as Bauman expressed it, where the gardener used modern, straightforward measurement ideals to, 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 to make sure that no plants get higher than the other, whereas the forest keeper takes, takes his or her time and wait. And the, from the parents and from the educational point of view, uh, a preschool or a kindergarten was a better solution where you could see more in the natural way how the child matured. And against that came the, the modern uh, psychology and, and, and medicine doing more uh, metrical observations using, using the test. So you can see that sort of internal <laughs> debates underneath of, of this school readiness discussion uh, and its relation to preschool. Yeah, uh, fascinating talk. I first had a little comment based on what Kanak was saying. It's actually very interesting to look later for for national differences. Like in our case in Hungary, the comprehensive school system, eight-year school, was introduced through political moves of equalization of opportunity in the late 40s. And the whole issue of school maturity was only raised about 20 years later, in the late 60s. So it was first a general political movement. But my question is, in this 15-year discussion of school maturity in Sweden, was the issue of possible girl and boy differences ever raised? I know it, it's, later it's a big issue, especially in adolescence and so on, but was it raised in these discussions? Here it was not. Here, here age was seen as a neutral ground, so it should not, it was to move away from social class, democratic, and gender as yeah. as a ground for sorting. So here there were not talks of any differences, although it was seen in the statistics, but that was not really taken into consideration until later. And did you have in big cities gender separation of schools? Not that this, no. before this. In not Hungary here. it was true until the late 50s, yeah. that in big cities, boys and girls were in different schools, even in elementary schools. That is 62. <laughs> we had, we had girls. 62, yeah. Some of the girls' schools that were before, they continued, but they were not allowed to say no to boys. So they had to, so there were, so boys were allowed, but they were still called girls' schools, but they were still part of this uh, curriculum for the unit school. And then they were, 
Yeah, so most that. went to mixed schools, but there were also girls who were up until like the 50s. Yeah. My mother born 1940, she attended the girls' school, but she was sort of one of the. And boys were allowed. <laughs> boys were allowed. Even though know, they were not so common. I, I did have a question. I suddenly forgot my question. <laughs> <laughs> interested in, in, yeah, I think I overlapped a bit with the, the, the educational school. Oh, yes, yeah, so but my question was about sources. That was, um, I mean, I was curious, and I don't know if this fits in at all with the scope of your project, but um, what you can say about the reception of these policies that were debated and, and, and kind of fought over to what extent there's kind of this journalistic discussion um, about these things and, and not just kind of the authors of the political discussion. And is this something that's part of the scope of your research? When it comes to school readiness, the journalistic cover was more of um, now it is happening, not should it or should it not, I'm not critical in any sense. It was, there, are, um, there are photos and little, today 2,000 kids do the school readiness test in Stockholm or something like that. So it was very neutral covering from, from media when it comes to school readiness. Of course, when it comes to the whole project of the comprehensive school, there, were, there was more of a debate. But this was just accepted as okay, this is what we do now. And, and then in the practice, it was not at all as, as vague as we have seen that it was actually behind the scenes. It, it was like, we do school readiness tests. Everybody is doing them. And uh, we have met many um, yeah, older people who very well remember their school readiness tests so yeah. that the seriousness of doing it. Yeah, up until the mid 80s, we found examples, especially when it comes to if you want to put your child in school when it's six, then you did the school readiness test. There's one more question. Like if you want. One more question quickly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was fascinated by the inclusion of these kind of, uh, let's say, layman in the committees and, and having an idea of, if I understand correctly, the point is a bit that they said, okay, well, this metric inclusion is not so necessary. And but then, as you know, what about, you know, they didn't really kind of um, pay a lot of detail to this layman's perspective. So then my question was, like, why did they ask them in the first place? I think the whole project about the comprehensive school was increasing democracy and democracy work ways in, in, in Swedish governing overall. So it was the, 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 the chief of the investigation was very clear about that we need a layman uh, council here to, 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 to allow for public opinions on our, on our investigation. These were huge in which investigations producing 20,000 pages of investigative material. So, yeah. But very good question. Thank you so much.